So, I'm uh, Hugh McLaughlin, I'm with Nick and Nick Shields. Frank Shields is my uh, collaborator, works for Compost Lab out in California. Many people have used uh, Frank's lab for some basic characterizations, both of compost and of biochars. Uh, Frank went through the composting development of standards decades ago and has been extremely uh, helpful in both IBIs, uh, wrestling this uh, thing to the ground and some of the earlier work. Um, as a child, and I want, I want to go up front and explain I'm a chemical engineer. I don't normally have to interface with people that have recourse to lawyers and things like that. So I probably need to issue a disclaimer that as a child, when I learned about Hannibal going through the Alps, I tended to identify with the elephants. And I felt that they brought a very positive role to that experience. So I'm going to be putting out some thoughts here that at times can be misconstrued as being blunt, but they represent my perspective in this space. McShield's method is very much intended to provide just a basic breakdown of what this biochar consists of. And it's really almost intended for a person who's making biochar to teach themselves about the properties of the biochar and how it might possibly be evolved in a better direction. Uh, along these lines, there's an excellent resource it's available out here at one of the booths, and we can go through this quite quickly this morning, but for detail, I urge you to access this particular uh, resource or look up McShield's method. It tears it apart, and it also gives some additional tips. For example, one of the most powerful techniques that you can use for biochar is called the SOAP test. Has anyone heard of or does anyone know what the SOAP test is? If my brother doesn't raise his hand, I'm going to walk over. I have to apologize to my brother. It's going to be a very long conference, John. Uh, you know, it's difficult to uh, change the family tree overnight. <laughs> a soap test is you make a biochar, and you t it's a dusty material, and you handle it, your hands are going to get black. And basically, you get that blackness on your hands. You bounce it around, and you walk over to cold water. You wash it off. And if the bulk of that blackness comes out, which is cold water, that's a very good sign. That implies it's mostly dry dust that's not interacting with your, your skin. If you need to use soap to get that blackness off, those are the tars. And right there, you're testing your char quite quickly for whether it's got an appreciable amount of tars. That's going to be hydrophobic, so when you put it in the soil, it's not going to wet out very nicely. And you're going to have sugars that leach out as you do wet that jar. So this is very quick and easy. In fact, after you send me the check for $25, you can do it as often as you like. <laughs> so the big issue is you're selling biochar. You're going through Whole Foods, and there's a bag of biochar. The question is, what's in it? And uh, I go back in this industry all the way back to a turn of green. So I mean, you can read the label of a turn of green, and you can wear your eyes out. But I don't think you're going to learn a lot about the biochar by reading the label. It's going to make a series of claims that are almost too good to be true. And in fact, in the case of Antria, it was way too good to be true. But one of the things that's clearly there is moisture. And moisture's not a bad thing, but it's like buying ham with some water at it. If you hold up the bag of ham, and there's this little slice floating around in the middle of it, maybe $2.19 a pound is not a great price for this ham. So we really want to take the moisture away. So this bag of biochar, on a weight basis, not so much on a volume basis, moisture comes out of biochar with virtually no change in volume. But if it's sold on a weight basis, or if you're picking it up or you're comparing two bags, you need to know whether you're holding a bag of water. Here's an example of some chars that we just pulled off the marketplace, and we checked the moistures. As you can see, most of the time these chars are relatively dry. Even your, foot, your wood pellets and your wood chips can be quite dry. But you've got some of your chars that have very uh, elevated levels of moisture. And uh, I took real issue with the people that sent me these straw chars, except they were my company making them. So I was not allowed to go into the real you know, social damage associated with it. What happened was, and I'll explain this, uh, we have a device that takes wood and makes char out of it and we spray it with water to cool it off at the end. Well, when we switched to straw, we put the same amount in the bin, but it was about a quarter of the weight of straw. 
So when it came out and got the same amount of water to cool it off, he was to say, it waterlogged. So it's an artificial effect, quite understandable. But if we were going to go to the marker with that, we needed to dial it down and get it right. Rather important concept in biochar. Biochar is an absorbing material. It behaves a bit like activated carbon. In fact, it has an awful lot in common. And it absorbs moisture. And that's a very big part of the biochar's unique dynamic in the soil. And I'll talk in a different talk about that. But it's a problem when you go to dry it. The traditional ASTM, chuck it into a drying oven at 105 degrees C for an hour. That works great for glassware. It doesn't work at all for biochar. You really need to take biochar up to about 150 degrees C. And that's because the absorbed water is not going to come off. And the penalty is that you may have 10% absorbed water in there because it's a good absorbing charge. And you're not going to take it off. So it's just becoming error. And when they say, well, that's kind of credit, it's a good absorbing charge, I'll look to a little more weight. Fine. If you're a scientist who likes to spew their data in one direction or another, have at it. You want to know the truth, go to 150C. Now, after 150C, you'll notice some of these other curves drop off quite dramatically. This is because above 150 degrees C, and especially above 200, you're starting to get into areas that if the material has not seen these temperatures before, it will start to then further pyrolyze. This is torrefaction, torrefaction type materials. And if that's happening, that's another big flag. Because now you've got a chart that's telling you right away, I've never even seen 300 degrees C. I'm black because the guy spray painted me black and stuck me in a bag and labeled it biochar. <laughs> America a great place or what? So, just to summarize this, you want to uh, dry it to 150 to 200 degrees C. I like 175. You can do this in a toaster oven. Gentlemen, go buy your own toaster oven. Because when you do what I did, which is walk up to the kitchen, stack the toaster oven, take it downstairs, use it for a month or two, and try to return it, it turns out this is, a, this is not going to work. <laughs> you end up buying the most expensive toaster oven available <laughs> as a punitive gesture. But it works fine. What you want to watch out for is you're going to be drying, you, know, you might dry a fair amount of biochar, maybe 150 grams, so you can do the other tests. Make sure that you don't get it underneath the rods and you don't get the white ashing occurring on the top because that toaster oven is not a sophisticated drying mechanism. So you can put a little bit of foil over, whatever. Just make sure you don't take it out with white frosting on top. And really, you know, since you're a professional, go buy a separate oven thermometer. That thermostat on a $20 toaster oven really is all it's practical. And that's plenty close. What else is in that bag of biochar? Well, ash. We know that all your biomasses have an ash constituent going in. It is going to get concentrated up because you're removing a lot of mass, and that mass is the organic volatiles coming off, and therefore your ash levels are going to be increased by about a factor of three or four. Now, woods come in, many woods come in at less than 1% ash, and so they only end up with three or 4% ash in the biochar, but grasses can have five or 6% ash as harvested. <laughs> And uh, rice holes are 30%, uh, 15% ash. So you get very high levels of ash potentially there. And you really need to uh, figure that out. And basically, uh, virtually all this ash tends to be soluble ash. And the reason for that is that uh, the way that ash got into the wood, and got out of the ground, was it got solubilized into the groundwater and got transported up by the tree as it took the water up and got the micronutrients, etc to build the rest of the tree. And therefore, that material at one point was solubilized. Now, uh, waterproof plants like rice hulls tend to create silicon dioxide, which is not a soluble ash. And we went out and pulled a bunch of the same chars, and what we're seeing here is those yellow bars at the top tend to be the ash constituents of the finished chars. Uh, the light yellow is soluble, the dark yellow is non-soluble. Uh, that ash fraction has some additional properties you can look into, but Fundamentally, the ash is going to do something in there. If it's uh, one of these uh, grasses and you've got 10-15% uh, ash to play with and you're putting down 10 tons an acre, you're putting down a ton and a half of, of an ash. And if that ash is lime, you need to know that. So to do that, what we tend to recommend is that you burn off all the organics. 
Uh, you can become very aggressive and try to get every last carbon out of it, but this again is intended to be kind of a screening tool, and if you do it the same way each time, and you try different things, you'll evolve yourself in the right direction. We prefer to do ashing not as according to ASTM, which is the ash test for coal, for combustion, because that's telling you how much ash will come out of your coal combustor. It's a pretty bad analog for what you're doing in biochar. We prefer 550, an open crucible, don't use the same toaster oven. This is Celsius, and your toaster oven better not go to 550 because you'll melt the counter below it and everything around it. But you can get a muffle furnace to get to those temperatures, uh, and I'll show you an easier way with a camping stove. Again, you want to just burn things off. Now, I'm going to take a poke here. IBI will allow you to call it biochar if it has no more than 90 If it has more than 90% ash, you can't call it biochar anymore. But it's less than 90% ash, it's going to fall in a class of biotech to be certified. So we, you know, we have a fair number of boiler ashes coming out here that have had a lot of carbon burned out of them, and they've got a significant amount of ash present. So we need to be able to see that. So these, if you're if you're into this, you can get yourself some equipment, add some significant figures. Uh, this is a uh, Really all it takes, go to eBay, uh, go to the, uh, the, the section on selling illegal drugs, and you can buy for about $10 a nice cocaine scale uh, out of the, uh, it's really created this market, I'm sorry. Plenty to support you, a hundredth of a gram, uh, and you weigh it up, go get yourself some, some tomato paste cans, cut them out, and uh, you can now set yourself up with a camping stove, and I can do, the drying test here to sufficient accuracy by just basically creating kind of a Dutch oven and cooking it to between 150C and 200 and let it sit till it's stabilized. You get good at it after you try it a couple times. And part of these tests is to have a little bit of a you know, chemistry background where you understand the concept of repeating an analytical <coughs> procedure and getting about the same answer. This kind of stuff. I urge people to flunk college chemistry several times. This may not be your calling but you should be able to find someone. Uh, on, the, on the right, I'm doing an ashing test. It's literally a tuna fish can. I lay a quarter of an inch down at the bottom. I heat it from the bottom, let the air get to the top, make sure I'm not blowing out a lot of mass, and cook it out. At the end of the day, sorry about the focus, but you burn it down to that dull gray material, and you pull it down and weigh it back again, and you're going to get two significant figures. You're going to know your ash constituent to the nearest percent. And you're looking at whether it's 4% or 15% or 50%. Then you can take this ash. Now I'll admit, if you're doing it over the, it's cooked, so it's lost a little control. If you do it in a muffle oven at 550, you can now take this ash and you can wet it out and check the pH. And you'll get a pretty good indication of the pH of what the biochar is going to be. Better yet, you've got the dry biochar. Why don't you re-wet it and check the pH of that mixture? PA, again, we go into a couple of things in the book. You've got conductivity, by, uh, IBI flagged electrical conductivity. A lot of salt in your biochar. For whatever reason, it's going to go into the soil water when you wet it out the first time. You're going to create brackish water in your soil. You probably ought to see that coming. So there's a lot you can learn just by poking at these things. And I don't want to accuse these things of being, you know, quantitative, overly quantitative. They're great directions to go in. You're trying various feedstocks. You can check them all for ash content, and you can check the ash for the amount of, you know, pH effect. You can check the ash for the amount of conductivity by buying, again, a $10 conductivity detector. I hate to tell you this, but TDS is salt. You can taste it. You know, Dick and I are such old chemists, we're used to shaking the liquid to tell how thick it is and how, you know, whether this is diluted sulfuric acid and, or concentrated based on the surface and this stuff. So it's, a, it's an acquired uh, skill, but it's not hard to acquire. And it tells you a very important thing. Did you buy a bag of ash? Did you buy a bag of moisture? Did you buy, what's biochar? So what is biochar? Well, in my mind, biochar isn't the water. It's not the ash. These things come along with it. But the ultimate long-term impact in the soil is going to be the organic modification you make to the soil matrix. And I very uh, simplistically, Frank and I decided that we would bust it into two parts, the 
supposed to make the mobile matter and the resident matter. How you tell them apart? Well, it's easy. You throw it on the ground, you come back five years later, you find it. The stuff you find is resident, the stuff that's missing is mobile. Well, like convenient. Thanks for a fairly tedious test. So you're stuck with trying to come up with some kind of accelerated aging to get out whatever's the mobile matter and leave behind some representative portion that you're going to call uh, resident matter. This is, and we get into this in the book, it's very different from the coal partitioning of volatile matter versus fixed carbon. Those tests are actually for predicting the behavior of coal when you throw it in as a pulverized feed into a coal combustor. The volatile matter comes off as a vapor and ignites. The fixed carbon that has to be burned out as carbon. And they relate to fuel density and they relate to combustion properties. The only thing you don't do is the biochar and burn it. So these tests really don't give you much go. So what we did, well first off we looked at a bunch of stuff. And uh, again, you're seeing here the pinks are the mobile fractions. We've actually uh, added both the carbon piece versus the non-carbon portion in the organics. And you see with your wood feedstocks on the uh, my side, these things are highly mobile. Now. But even this test, the way you'll see it's done on this one, is uh, creating some resident matter out of your jar. Well, guess what? When you take biomass, and heat it. In this test, you'll see heats it to 450C, you make some of it into char. So all this test really did when it did this partitioning was take your stuff and make it from biomass to biochar and tell you what your yield was. Your other chars, you can see by the time we get to the one on the, uh, on the far side, you're very high up between a lot of fixed carbon, a lot of resident carbon, and a lot of resident uh, oxygens and hydrogens into that uh, graphitic glass lattice. Okay, the mobile matter assay. And this is just a first pass. This isn't casting stuff. I'll be perfectly honest. Uh, we picked the temperature that we felt would be good for telling us if we had an undercooked jar. And would also leave us some information on high temperature jars. The, uh, the gasifier jars for these cook stoves they are quite high temperature exposure, but they have, depending on the conditions and how much Partitioning is in a gas fire, you have quite a bit of unburned material. I'd like to know its characteristics. Um, so you dry it, it's very critical to get a good dry sample because everything from here on out has the water pulled out of it. You will use this, you measure the ash on that because again, we're going we're to put the constraint in that on a dry weight basis, the ash plus the mobile matter plus the resident matter is going to add up to 100. That's because you can do it on an ash-free basis, but when I tell you, hey, you know, on an ash-free basis, it's 90% resident matter, and there's 11% that if it's not ash, well, guess what? It's a bag of ash. I don't really care. If it only had 8-9% carbon, it's a little bit. So that's why I put that, that constraint. And basically, you heat it to 450C, and what leaves is mobile matter. And what stays is resident matter. The researchers may go in and do some other weathering tests. Again, it's the burden of trying to prove that you're doing this partitioning. I got real uh, interested when the, I got bored, uh, and I got a soxalate extractor with all these extractions, and I made all these different colored solvents coming off all the carbons, and none of them looked any different, because I couldn't get the solvents back off them after I did the extraction. So I couldn't tell what was you know, resident matter, mobile matter, or the solvent. So this is a starting point again. This is a very useful tool. You can try one set of conditions on your carbonizer and then you run a different point on the dial and you're getting two different charts. Now you can check to see what the difference is. And you can decide in your own head. We have applications where high mobile matter chars are the best place to start. And that's generally in a case where you have sterile soils. You know, if you're going into sand with nothing alive in the soil and no organic carbon, a little mobile matter will kickstart this whole process of getting some soil microbial activity. And then you can have the resident matter additions in the future that can be better for water management. If nothing's alive, it don't matter. You know, black sterile soil is just as sterile as white sterile sand. 
So now we're getting pretty sophisticated. We're buying the same tuna or the same tomato paste cans, and we're sealing them up. And we chuck that into our, uh, our toaster oven. Remember the part about buy your own toaster oven? Because after you do this a couple of times, the toaster oven has this inexplicable odor of barbecue. And you chuck it in there, and you crank it up, and you're going to get a rough look at what comes up when you hit it with some heat. And actually, you'll learn quite a bit. If it drives you out of your garage, you ought to take a hint. Because your plant wants as little to do with it as you want to do with it. And you'd be surprised. I've tested, I test people's charts because I want you to know where you fit them, the spectrum. I don't want you to go and spend a lot of your money creating a chart creation capability and then have somebody come in and blow you out of the water because the chart is 10 times more enjoyable. I probably tested 200 charts, 2,000 charts. And I got charred. I measured about a gram of char I've had a gram of char drive me out of my lap. So you can imagine when you start throwing it in the truck rolls, how much organic matter and how much, you know, you're getting the odors, you're getting the mass loss, you're getting a lot of data. Not quantitative, but real good characterization of what that plant's going to start seeing. So what else is in biochar? Well, we've got two unique properties of biochar that play out once it's in the soil. They're called cation exchange capacity. It's a standard soil characterization metric. And then there's absorption capacity. Basically, they're to the extent that this, this naturally Creative material has the behaviors of an ion exchange resin, grabbing up ionic species, and absorption capacity is the extent that it's going to behave like activated carbon, which are non ionic type absorptions of uh, organic molecules. Uh, you could create the same effect in the soil by pulverizing ion exchange resins and activated carbons. And after you file for bankruptcy, you can publish the papers and go on to get your Nobel Prize. You'll go broke doing it. This is an important slide in my mind because we looked at the, these things. And what we found is that virtually all the chars we were pulling in, this goes all the way from wood pellets, uncarbonized material through you know, the spectrum. Straws and the other ones. Everybody had an appreciable amount of cation exchange capacity. This is not to be confused with EC, electrical conductivity, which is the salt concentration. This is literally the cation exchange, and it's not a fun test yet. Flush it with one air I have another one. I made Frank do that. The other difference is that the absorption, which is the darker bars, the purple bars, really bounce around. You're Raw material, your biomasses have virtually no absorption capacity, and uh, some chars are very significant, some chars are, are insignificant. The, the big problem is the cation exchange capacity is not a stable property, and it'll actually develop over time in the soil. You'll get oxidation to create this cation exchange effect. Absorption, on the other hand, is created during carbonization. If it isn't there on day one, it's not going to pop up over time. So my leading advice on cation exchange capacity, actually I think Frank may have talked me into this, is don't bother. Really, you're learning a number that's a little bit of a transient, and it's mostly because uh, the mobile matters, uh, quite often in raw biochars, you get elevated cation exchange because mobile matter has a lot of organic acid constituents in it. You get a lot of acetic acid in there, and that does the exchanging. <clears throat> but you put it in the soil, it leaches out, and it gets turned into bug food, and it's gone. So it wasn't there after a while. It didn't do any good to measure it because it disappeared. However, other things oxidized up and formed new cation exchange. And in fact, the, the major mechanism in aged chars is probably the absorption of humic and fulvic acids onto the char by absorption, creating a capacity for, ion, for, for cation exchange. Cation exchange is the cations, there's an anion exchange equivalent, it's even worse to run that test, so we had to use this cation exchange as a metric for whether we're seeing that behavior. This is the tendency of the soil to grab an inorganic fertilizer, a phosphate or a potassium or ammonium ion and hold on to it and not have it leached off by excess rainfall. Very important property. The 
and it shields absorption back. Now, Debbie, I know going into this talk, this is probably going to cost me my Christmas card. I use a test called R134A. It's a challenge gas. I do it at 100 degrees C. It's an elevated temperature. It has an advantage that it makes the test a lot faster because the diffusion at those temperatures. The unfortunate thing is there's about 10 of these instruments in the world, which makes them totally inaccessible. That's why I ended up doing 2,000 assays. You can do another test out of an analytical lab called butane activity. Uh, it is measuring butane uptake at 25 degrees C. They're measuring very different parts of the absorption spectrum. You know, I'm a, I'm a nerd. So they're, but they give very good quantitative correlations. Unfortunately, BET, nitrogen surface area assay, is worthless. And the reason is it's done at liquid nitrogen temperature, minus 176, or 176 degrees Kelvin or something, wherever liquid nitrogen hangs out. And what happens, and we wrote papers on this, I've done papers with microamoritics, in that temperature regime, two things happen. The first thing that happens is the TARS, the mobile matter, freezes into a solid, and you start counting it as a new surface area. And upon heating it up and putting it in the soil, it goes back to being an amorphous material and doesn't have that surface area. But the other thing that happens is you don't get any diffusion. So the amount you get in is really not very reducible. Very much a function of the macro pore structures, diffusion in and out, those kind of diffusion links. So bottom line, uh, nitrogen is not good because of the temperature. Turns out BEP carbon dioxide is substantially better. Done at zero degrees C. So we haven't frozen the tars, or we haven't removed them so much from the actual soil environment, and the diffusion is monstrously fast. I have created what I call a grading system for biochar. You want to apply a letter grade to biochar. You take this R134A test, and it's it's accessible. I actually publishing up something called GAX on a budget. It doesn't require a lot of money to build it. It does require a graduate student to run it because it's terribly labor intensive. But basically, you take this absorption capacity, which will range up to about 10% in charge, as low as 2. You divide that, that weight percent, that 2 to 10 and half, and you get a number. You call that your grade point, like you went to the university. And you went to a real school, not MIT, so none of this 5.0 equals an A stuff. You have 4.0 is an A, <coughs> and that becomes your grade. So if you had a 6.6 .6 weight percent char, it's a good char, really. I see a lot of those. But two, that's a B plus char. I've seen relatively few A's. I've seen a lot of D's. I need to tell you. That's a different paper, and it's a different thing. This is why we're so focused on that, is this absorption peak. And this is why you hear so much about low temperature chars and high temperature chars and things like that. Is that if you don't get up to a high enough temperature, you don't develop this property. You don't drive out enough mobile matter, and you don't create enough graphene to be doing the activated carbon phenomenon. So there's a lot of data on that slide, but that peak is what it's all about. And the problem is, oops, the problem is I didn't put that slide in. The problem is that this is where it turns black at 300 degrees C. And this is where it makes good biochar. And this is the yield, it's not like a rock, as I go with that. So if I am selling it by weight and not testing it for performance, I make this stuff. It's called charcoal. Lots of mobile matter burns very nicely. If I'm going to make something to pour over time in the soil, I got to go through 600 degrees C. I got to go twice as high a temperature in Celsius. It's tough on the machine. If you have a, car, a charcoal making machine, and you try to go to these temperatures, it does You may find that you have got a brand new charcoal making machine the next time you run it because the last time it burned itself up. So that's it. It's in the book. I'm here to answer questions. I just want to take one or two questions, because I want to get Jeff Licht up here with his colleague, because he's doing some really innovative stuff, creating new kind of quick and dirty assets. So a couple of questions. Uh, 
of which you can avoid the ones like, why are you so nasty? I'm the youngest of four. It's difficult to run the hall. Yes, sir. All right, microwaves are, are, the question is how about microwaves for drama? The problem you've got with microwaves is you are in fact heating a, a, a partitioning of your substrate. So at the molecular level, I don't heat everybody to the same temperature as a group. I take the water molecules and I make them extremely hot and right next to them is a stone cold graphene sheet. And so it's very difficult to know whether the water molecule got vaporized, stay hot enough and actually left basically wait until it got to a cold chunk of graphene to get reabsorbed. That, that is absolutely what you have to do, so you have no way, and that's fine, you're there. Um, I, I worry because absorbed chars, I mean, we when we absorb toluene on carbon, an analogous situation, we raise the boiling point of that toluene by 400 degrees Celsius in that pore. It boils off at 110 degrees C in the lab, and it boils off at 500 plus degrees C once it's absorbed. Last question. Um, two questions. Um, you were talking about your mobile versus your resident material, and then you were talking about cooking off certain things, and you mentioned also salts in there. Salts won't, clarify me, salts won't cook off, but they will mobilize and leach out as water, rainwater comes back. Exactly. In the, in the heating process, your salts are not going to volatilize. Although that's where the 550 C comes in, because at 600 degrees C, your carbonates will decarboxylate and become oxides, and you'll lose the CO2 mass. So all of a sudden, you'll actually take that mass off, and you won't count it as ash. And then you'll end up with lime, calcium oxide, and you'll get a pH effect. So you kind of really fool yourself to get too hot on this, this ash test. But you're right, once you're back in the soil and you wet it all out, these are soluble ashes, they all leach back out. Now keep in mind, that's a first season phenomenon, first couple rinses, because those dissolvable materials are going to leave. I want to introduce Jeff Licht, who's on to something new and exciting, and thank you very much. I'll be around for the whole conference. So.